Well, three preliminary comments before I get into the heart of what I want to say. First, I'm the first speaker after lunch. <laughs> Early in school, they used to have us roll out a rug to take a nap, but we had so much energy. I think the only one taking a nap was the teacher. And, uh, and then as I got to be an adult and I needed a nap, they wouldn't let us do that anymore. And so here we are. I recognize that uh, the, the speaking order, so what I say is, is that I have some lovely photographs uh, as part of my presentation, and also sometimes I'm mildly entertaining, and if we're lucky, this will be one of those times, and so hopefully we'll keep your attention. Okay. The second disclaimer is, is I'm going to try to pack about three days worth of talk into 20 minutes, and so I know that I'm necessarily glossing over some key points. Hopefully that'll spur some questions as opposed to you thinking there are tremendous gaps in my knowledge. I can prove that later. And, uh, the, uh, the, and the third thing I want to say is, is that uh, my wife and partner, whose picture I'll show you later, of 37 years, will ask me before we even get home from the airport, did you inform them that you were severely hearing impaired? I do not want to face her wrath, uh, not after a long flight. And so, yes, I'm informing you of that. So when we have questions and answers, uh, Nina is going to help me if I need translation. Don't hesitate to talk to me out here. It won't hurt you to repeat, and I'll eventually get it. And uh, if anything else, you can text it to me, and uh, we can have a nice, lovely conversation. With that... Uh, what I want to say is, is that, um, see, which one of these does, ah, okay. I arrived Sunday here at the idyllic grounds and I uh, was uh, using my phone for affect regulation as most people in modern society do and I was reading the NBC News and note, uh, noted the headline right away, vaccine skeptic message gets bolder. And it makes me realize uh, a couple of years ago I was testifying before our state legislature and state commission because they were asking me to do a study dealing with adolescent sexual assault because our state has the dubious distinction of having one of the two highest rates in the country. And one of the things that I pointed out to them is is that there are a lot of really good people with really good programs who are really committed to solving this particular problem. And if that all got the job done, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today. And I would say the same thing about this. We, there are a lot of really good programs, there are a lot of really good people working really hard, and yet here they are getting bolder. And so that means not that we've done anything inadequate, it means we need to do more. And, that's, uh, and hopefully I can contribute to that conversation. So the issue there is to say, how do we talk with people, not at people, who speak from hesitancy or denial? And when I listened to people talk, and I saw some of the presentations this morning, and there were also some quotations related to that, you realize that you have some people who have a sense of conviction, a sense that they have the truth, the sense that they are right, and when you talk with them uh, as if somehow they are not, because you're presenting facts, of course we know that simply debating the evidence or debunking myths are not always pathways to vaccine acceptance. In fact, I can give you plenty of reason why what that's going to do is engender an argument with the person, and that argument is one that in the end you're going to lose, uh, if, if indeed you want them to get vaccinated. And so uh, the issue then is, is where do we go with that? So um, this, uh, up to this point, we have heard a lot of great presentations with great information, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I believe in social marketing. I've been involved in social marketing campaigns, and there is a power to change there. I also think that we heard some very nice presentations uh, about the program Sky, uh, which I like the, the name. It made me think of Saki, but that's just me. And uh, at any rate, uh, I can't pay me. I wanted some sushi at that point. Anyway, the uh, the point of it is is that it is important that we have good messages. Good messaging is critical, but it's also important to recognize that communication is so much more than messaging. What I'm going to do is spend a few minutes talking about that because that gives the backdrop as to what we are doing with the AIMS approach. And so I want to to meander a little bit, and then I promise I will get back to vaccines. It is important to realize that communication is more than just messaging. In fact, it is bioactive. That communication is a process that is a whole body experience that, uh, that, that plays a role in the biologies of all of us as we interact. Just some brief highlights. We know 
that communication, how we talk with each other, shapes, indeed creates, neural pathways in the brain. So that brain structure is in part a function of human interaction. We change the human interaction due to neuroplasticity. We can literally change the brains of people. This is an important realization, not only for how we raise infants, but also in terms of how we talk with each other, in terms of how we relate to the people in our environment. And I will spend some more time talking about that in a minute. Second, it is important to realize that communication impacts us at the epigenetic level. How genes function, whether they turn on or off, which impacts our ability to manifest or not genetic predispositions, is in part related to the communication that we engage in. And so that's not about the content of the message, it's about the very act of communicating itself that makes our genes function the way that, that, that plays a part in the way our genes function the way they do. In fact, it can impact immune function. And we know that we can talk in ways that strengthen immune function, and we can talk in ways that diminish immune function. And for people in health, both public and direct health care, that should seem to me to be something important. We know, for example, that the expression of positive emotions, I'm not talking about feeling positive emotions, but the expression of positive emotions, the facial expressions that we have, has been correlated in research with coronary vascular disease. And so we can actually train people to engage in different facial expressions, which can actually impact their susceptibility to coronary, to, to CBD. And It'll probably come as no surprise to you. I, I am, after all, a professor of women's studies that that correlation is much higher amongst men than it is amongst women. Just saying. Okay, now, the, uh, but, and we've also found, for example, when healthcare providers establish empathic connections, it can actually shorten illness duration in their patients. And so how you talk to your patients makes a difference in how healthy they're going to be when they emerge from your office. We also know that, and this is important, that communication is not exclusively a conscious activity. Because of mirror neuron systems and other functions, a lot of what goes on between people is something we're not conscious of, which is one of the reasons why our data we collect when we do surveys and when we do interviews gives us a rather incomplete picture of what people are thinking, feeling, or how they're going to act, because a lot of what's going on in communication is not something that they're consciously connected to. And finally, I want to suggest that communication is systemic both within and outside of the body. And so you can tell, for example, when somebody really, really angers you, you can feel it all the way up and down. Just as when somebody says something to you that brings you great joy, you can feel it all up and down. That's causing biological change. We can use that knowledge of biological change to improve the way we interact with each other, particularly, but not exclusively, in face-to-face -face interaction. I mean, this is part of what is behind our uh, uh, AIMS approach. And so when we communicate, we recognize that how we communicate is more important to our health than what we have to say. So the message is important, but if we don't, if we only focus on that, we lose sight of that which is making, is critically shaping what is going on. So one of the questions that I often teach people is, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Do you want to argue until you win or do you want to be effective in accomplishing what you want to accomplish? And so if we want to deal with vaccine hesitancy in an effective way, what we're not going to do is debate. What we're going to do is to create a situation that focuses on building trust, on building receptivity to a message, and then we're much more likely to succeed. And I'll give some evidence of that in a moment. I have some non-vaccine uh, situations I want to talk about to indicate where we've used this particular approach. In part, I want to talk about the trainability, but I also want to highlight two critical points that undergird the AIMS approach. We currently, that's the other parish sprout doing the training there, so I have to give her a shout out. There's only two of us on the planet, and so it would be remiss if I didn't point her out. At any rate, uh, we're working with the largest provider of primary health care services to refugees in Jordan. And in that particular situation, we're pot we've been piloting in a clinic for a year and a half, trying to infuse mental health and psychosocial support in terms of in what they do. And it's predicated on this, this notion of communication. And so what we did is provide uh, early on three hours of training uh, uh, to people 
to think about communication in this particular context. And what we're do and so in that particular situation, what we do is recognize first that we're talking about the process of communication, not a message, but the conversation itself. I say something to you, you say something to me, I say something to you, and we have the nonverbal going on all the time, but there's a conversation, and any given message is embedded in that total stream. And what we tell them, what we try to teach is, is that the way that conversation works is important. And let me give an example of that. In this particular case, the dentist, and you can see, when we first went there, we're not talking about people that were feeling really good about the situation. In fact, he reported that he was having near burnout, which is a real common problem with the physicians in this case. One of the physicians we talked to saw from 9 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, 86 patients. It's astronomical. It's no wonder that they burn out. And so we worry about secondary stress. But communication is mutual, so we can serve both them and the refugees simultaneously. So we gave them some dental supplies so that they could have conversations with children. And you can see, we're not talking about a lot of smiling there either at the beginning. And they're giving them some oral hygiene instruction. Could have been anything. This just happened to be an excuse. The content was irrelevant. But as they go through the training, now you can see we're getting some good positive affect here while we're watching him scrub the dinosaur's teeth. And then, in the end, we see all kinds of smiles, and most importantly, him. And so what we're seeing here is the children getting better, they're having a good vibration, the doctor's getting better, and we're creating a better circumstance. Perhaps even better, this is in his words, and so I didn't, this is a dense text, but this is a story from the dentist. Uh, he said, I once had a patient who required a surgical extraction of a tooth, but they had an infection, so I gave him an antibiotic and told him to come back in a week. After a week, he came back, and I told him he has to wait for another week until the infection cleared out. He was so upset to hear that, especially because he was in pain, and he started yelling at my face. From inside, I felt aggravated, to say the least, and I wanted to defend myself because the patient was not respectful and rude. But then I remembered that the training about trauma and how it affects patients' brains, and I made a decision to calm myself. So I took a deep breath and sat down and asked the patient to sit down. After he started to calm down, I then explained to him slowly why it is bad to do the surgery if the infection is still there and how the side effects can be worse. He eventually agreed to come back after another week. He came back and did the surgery and he left the clinic. Two weeks after the patient came back to the clinic, when he saw me, he grabbed my hand and bowed down to kiss it. I was shocked and told him why. And he said, you understood my pain and you were a patient with me. You contained me and helped me even through I was rude. Thank you. If I had not calmed down and breathed, that poor guy would have left our clinic upset in pain and would not have come back and would have not had the means to pay for a private dentist in the surgery. I saw a smile on the patient's face when he left and I had the same smile on my face. Happy I helped and grateful for the training that taught me how to deal with such a, a situation. We can train people to do this. We can change people in those situations. Second aspect of this, aside from process of communication, is helping people feel felt that you understand them from their point of view. And we'll relate that to hesitancy in a moment. In this particular case, a person asked us to interview him. He saw us, we were in a clinic uh, near the Syrian border. And in the end, he thanked us for listening to his story. He wanted to be heard, he wanted to be felt. And when we did that, it mattered. We can do this in other contexts as well. So when I teach a class, you know, and, and I have a student, these are uh, screenshots of Facebook, but she points out, I would, not, I would never have uh, thought that I was, um, I can't read that. <laughs> you probably can. <laughs> Bad angle here. At any rate, we'll try this. I would have never thought that I could take on the world, but it showed me just how capable I am. She felt felt, and that made a difference for her. Another example of that is... When she says, I find my, uh, she says, after each conversation, I find myself thirsting for knowledge. I am looking forward to our conversations regarding CMM and my future, which is a particular communication theory. The importance of that is, is both of these students saw themselves as dead end. Now one's in graduate school, the other's gone to graduate school. And it's not because of what I taught in the class. It's because they felt felt. And that is the key thing, and to recognize that communication does that. 
So, the process of communication, how do we get there from here? In one other example, we did a pilot program in uh, Sierra Leone during the Ebola virus outbreak where we took these same principles and an independent research firm looked at initial interactions and one of the things I point out here from the uh, villagers view communities frontline staff is benefiting financially from the old Ebola outbreak, which always strikes me eerily like what people say about pharmaceutical companies, right? And then from the frontline training staff, they were frustrated with community resentment and mistrust. One day of training on these same basic things and frontline staff were better able to turn the situation opportunities into dialogue. Uh, they were better able to de-escalate tense situations and they actually ended up developing, engendering enough trust and felt compelled to go beyond the situation. The point of that is, is that it doesn't take a lot of training in the kinds of things we're talking about to truly change the performance of people. So, now we get back to vaccines. Based upon this, and in conversations with Angus, he tells me to create an algorithm for the conversation. I claim we can't really do this, and he said try it anyway. And so this is what we came up with, and we've been piloting it. And the idea is AIMS methods for healthy conversations. It's not about the message, but about how the physician or the healthcare professional talks with the people. And so it starts with announce. And what we know from research is, is if you walk in and simply say, it's time to get your vaccines, most people will say yes. That's consistent with the data we saw last night. That's consistent with some of the data we saw this morning. Some people, however, will hesitate. Then the first thing we should do is ask a question. It is the questions that control the situation and it is the question that will give you the information that you need. Now one of the things that I always point out is it's better to ask oops, it's better to ask how or what rather than why. If I ask you why you think something I am asking you to create a rationale for what you're saying. Once you create a rationale, you will feel compelled to defend it, and it will never move you. If I ask how you came to that conclusion, you will describe a process that got you from where you were to where you are now. Well, I talked to my neighbor, I talked to my, my, my child, I, I saw something on TV, I saw a comment on social media, that's how I got to this point. Though person is still movable, because they haven't committed themselves to a position because they've only described how they got there. And so there's more we can say about which questions to ask, but that's important. Once we ask the questions, we need to listen. And we need to listen in a whole body way. And what we do is then we mirror. And we're mirroring, what we're trying to do is not parrot, but repeat back so that they understand that we understand their position from their point of view, not from our point of view. Once they understand that you understand your posi their position from their point of view, they will begin to feel felt. And when you have that, you have greater receptivity. These may be an iterative process when you do this. Once you do that, then we move to secure, which is to say, however the conversation's going, we move to secure trust so that we can move forward in the future. It may be, for example, that you've had a conversation and they have said, oh, wow, geez, I didn't really understand that. And you say, okay, then you go back to announce. Let's, let's get the vaccines done. And they say, good, and everything's great. That will actually happen sometimes. It may be that they're still hesitant in which case, you can acknowledge that they still have some concerns. You can set the stage for a future conversation. Maybe ask them if you can send them some information. And when you do that, you have their, their trust in mind and you can move forward. It may be that they're still steadfastly a denier. You can identify with them, tell them that, and I think this is very much related to the, the Saki I'm kidding, Sky. The, the, see, I was just seeing if you're awake. Okay, the uh, 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 position of, of empathize is that if you get to that point and you say, well, I, I understand that your position, but both of us care about your child or both of us care about your health, let's go ahead and take care of the rest of our business and we'll revisit this some other day, then you likely have secured the option of moving forward with that conversation and continuing to talk with the person. 
we're in the piloting phase of this, and so we, we uh, would be delighted with some questions. At the same time, I spent a lot of time giving the backdrop to let you know that there is good science on which this is built on, and that we have tested this in the sense in other settings and find that it works, and I have every reason to believe it will work well with vaccine hesitancy as well. So in relate to the question this morning of how does this relate to other platforms, I think that becomes fairly obvious in that particular sense. So communication for oral health, let's get people vaccinated. I just used the picture of the flower because I thought it looked nice. I hope you like it. And, uh, <laughs> and it was nice. And then otherwise, thank you for listening.